have Professor Darren Chemoglu, who is a renowned economist and professor at MIT. His research focuses on technology and who it benefits. Darren, thank you so much for joining us. Please tell us a little bit more about your research. Thank you, Gabby. It's great to be with you. And yes, absolutely. I think this issue of choice is critical and it's been the centerpiece of my work because there is a narrative for much of the the last 30 years has been present with us, but it's become amplified in the age of AI, which sees everything as inevitable. There is a particular path of technology that we have to follow. The only thing we can do is to make the mistake of not following it fast enough. And then this is sort of joined with the corollary that somehow AI, because it has great capabilities, is going to benefit everybody. The reality, I think, is very, very different. On the one hand, we see exactly today that AI is not benefiting everybody. Those who control AI, especially the way that AI is developing right now, are reaping the benefits, and there are a lot of disruptive costs for the rest. But secondly, my research and history emphasize that there is nothing inevitable about the direction of progress. There are many different paths that we can take. We can use AI to complement humans, to help workers, or we can use AI to help those who are already powerful, the most authoritarian governments, the biggest firms, sideline workers, silence dissent. Those have very different consequences, and that's just two points along a wider spectrum. And I think where we are on that spectrum is a human choice. The problem is, when you say a human choice, it's a bit indeterminate. Whose choice is that? Well. At some level, it's the choice of the people who are developing AI. But that's really not the right way to see it because we are the ones, as society, as democratic citizens, as governments, as regulators, we are the ones who allow them to have that choice. So it's actually our choice to decide what are the parameters, restrictions on that, and who is entitled to make those decisions. Well, looking at AI, as you know, UNESCO developed the first global standard on AI, and we're really interested in um, helping policymakers make good decisions around AI. What do you think policymakers can do now to really make sure that AI benefits everyone? A lot. They can do a lot. And thanks to UNESCO, indeed, I think UNESCO has been a leader in emphasizing the social aspect of AI and that we need ethical standards as well as legal standards for dealing with this new AI age. And the issue is that we are powerful in many different ways. It may appear right now that nobody can keep up with AI and it's going to be just the decisions of Elon Musk or Sam Altman or some other big CEO who's going to determine what to do with AI. But actually, if you look at both the digital age and even the recent past, the more recent past, you'll see that choices that we make as democratic citizens have a first order effect. F Facebook, for example, was much worse in terms of how it exploited people's attention and what it allowed and what it tried to monetize. Today, even though regulation hasn't changed appreciably, Facebook is much under much greater pressure and hasn't completely cleaned up its act. But it has improved relative to what it was in the 2000, uh, late 2010s. Regulators have even greater choice. Now, it may appear the people who are most powerless are workers and developing countries. They have no voice in AI. But that can change too. If workers organize and labor unions become concentrated on AI, that can change. Developing countries can organize as well so that their voice is heard in AI. So when we're looking at regulation, what do you think that we need to regulate first when it comes to AI? That's a difficult question because there is no agreement on that. But my perspective, which is not shared by everybody, is that we need a different mindset for regulation. To me, the most important issue is the direction of AI, how we're developing AI. That requires that the overall regulatory environment is centered on
providing good incentives for the development of AI. Whereas right now, we have a re reactive regulatory strategy. Tech companies do something. When we look at what could the harms be, and then we try to react to them. That has to change. I think a holistic approach of saying this is the kind of AI we want, these are the incentives, how we can change those incentives, how we can set a broad legal uh, environment for the present and the future, those are the things that we need. And of course, I find it interesting when you use words like choice because there is an aspect of AI that's generative. We don't always know how we're going to control it. How can we ensure that there's um, safety when looking at this aspect of how technology is evolving? The fact that it's generative increases the importance of doing the things that we are talking about. But we should also not exaggerate AI's capabilities. I'm not an AI pessimist. I think there are amazing advances we are going to see, and we can get significant benefits. But generative AI is nowhere close enough to be human-like, sentient, or intelligent. So we shouldn't anthropomorphize AI and say, because it's generative, it's suddenly going to develop a character and it's going to feel, it's going to start posing a threat. Instead, the threat is AI as a tool being used by actors who have incentives that are not aligned with society. People who send deep, deep fakes, people who silence others, or companies that use AI in ways that are bad for workers, not so good for their shareholders, not so good for society, or AI companies that develop AI in a way that crashes their opponents and silences society. So I think it's the human agents behind AI that are the problem right now and I think in the foreseeable future. And I know that in your research you have looked at periods in history where people are also facing this kind of transformative change. Could you maybe give us one example where, where this has happened and economies have suddenly taken a, a leap in either direction? Well, I think the one that most people are familiar with is the British Industrial Revolution, which started sometime in the middle of the 18th century. It was a truly discontinuous event from an economic point of view or from the point of view of new factories built. It's not discontinuous, but from the point of view of suddenly people changing their perspective, thinking that they could start applying technology in order to transform work. That was a real big change. And at first, there was great hope. But when you look at how it developed in the first 90 years or so, it also shows the dark side of that. Even though the British Industrial Revolution was led by new men, very few women unfortunately, people who came from middle class backgrounds, were rising together with the technology, it actually was very impoverishing for a large segment of society. It led to much worse working conditions. It didn't improve wages. Health conditions, living conditions got horrible. Life expectancy in major cities such as Manchester may have dropped to about 30 years at birth. And you see how hope and despair could coexist. And it's, again, about choice. Both hope and despair there were part of the equation because it was an amazingly hopeful period, and we are the beneficiaries of it. But if it was used the wrong way, technology developed the wrong way, technology applied in the wrong way, people being silenced without rights, then you see the despair as well. And my final question is, we've talked about policymakers and what they could be doing. What about people like you and me and our use of AI? Is there any best practice that you think we should be following? Oh, so many issues. I mean, I think, from the point of view of individuals, first of all, the first thing we have to think about is how to prepare ourselves for the age of AI. It is coming. I don't think it's anywhere as transformative as people claim it to be. It's not going to lead to super intelligent machines anytime soon or perhaps ever, but it's going to change the labor market. So how do we change ourselves in the education process? After that, in the work process, those are important. I think flexibility is going to be very important, having skills like social skills that work alongside AI is going to be very important. But then there is the other 
aspect of this problem, which is not as selfish actors, but as citizens. What are our responsibilities? And I think the most important one is to have a voice. If we don't have a voice, then big tech companies have won. Whether they use that power for good or bad, there might still be a debate. I'm not very hopeful. But what they want is they set the agenda. They set the future of technology. I think the world would be a happier place if tech companies, technology scientists, regulators, and democratic citizens all have a say, and hopefully the developing world has a say, hopefully workers have a say in this. So I think our social responsibility is to have a voice and encourage others to have a voice. Well, it's good to know that we're all empowered in some way. I think we are more empowered than we often take it for granted. Obviously, each one of us matters little, but all together, I think we could have much bigger influence than people typically assume. Professor Darren Achemoglu, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you very much, Gabby. It's my pleasure. And thank you for joining us on another episode of UNESCO Talks. Please uh, stay up to date on, on this channel and please do leave your comments um, and any questions that you may have. We will get back to you. Thank you very much.